Picture this. It's 1953, and Ford executives are staring at a clay model that looks more like it belongs on a runway than a highway. The designer stands there explaining how he's literally copying the exhaust ports from an F-102 Delta Dagger fighter jet and turning them into taillights. The room goes silent. Someone finally speaks up. You want to put jet fighter parts on a car? The designer doesn't blink. Not parts. The entire philosophy. This is the story of how one man's obsession with military aviation created the most iconic American personal luxury car of the 1950s, and how the 55 to 57 Thunderbird became the only production car literally designed using aerospace engineering principles. To understand why Ford would let a designer treat their new sports car like a fighter plane, we need to travel back to 1951. The Korean War is raging. American pilots are getting their first taste of jet combat. And back in Detroit, car designers are watching newsreels of F-86 Sabres dogfighting MiG-15s over the Yalu River. The public is obsessed with jets. Kids are building model planes. Adults are booking flights just to experience jet travel. The sound barrier had been broken just four years earlier. Everything about the future screams speed, thrust, and swept wings. Meanwhile, Ford has a problem. Chevrolet just unveiled the Corvette. It's sleek, it's fiberglass, and it's stealing headlines. Ford needs a response, and they need it fast. But Henry Ford II doesn't want just another sports car. He wants something that captures the spirit of the era. Enter Frank Hershey, Ford's chief stylist, and a young designer named Bill Boyer. But the real catalyst? A man most people have never heard of, Gordon Burig. He'd designed the legendary Cord 810, and he had an idea that sounded insane. Why not design a car the same way Lockheed designs fighters? Ford's design team wasn't just looking at pictures of jets. They were at Edwards Air Force Base. They were measuring actual aircraft. Boyer spent three weeks at North American Aviation studying the F-100 Super Sabre that was still classified. He wasn't there to copy styling cues. He was there to understand aerodynamics. The team discovered something fascinating. Fighter jets of the era used what's called area rule, a principle where the fuselage narrows where the wings attach to reduce transonic drag. Boyer realized this same principle could work on a car. Make the body narrower at the door openings. Flare it out at the fenders. The result? Better high-speed stability and less wind noise. But here's where it gets interesting. The Thunderbird's famous porthole windows? Those weren't just for looks. They were directly inspired by the F-86 Sabre's cockpit design. The Sabre had small windows behind the canopy to eliminate blind spots during combat maneuvers. Ford's designers realized the same concept could solve the visibility problem created by the Thunderbird's rakish roofline. The technical specifications of the 55 Thunderbird revealed just how serious this aerospace influence was. The body featured a drag coefficient of 0.37, exceptional for 1955. For context, most cars of the era were pushing 0.50 or higher. The Ford Sedan, 0.48. The Corvette, 0.42. Under the hood sat the Y-Block 292 cubic inch V8. Now this engine wasn't particularly exotic. 193 horsepower with the standard carburetor, 198 with the optional four-barrel. But the way it was mounted was pure aircraft thinking. The engine sat lower and further back than any other Ford product, achieving a 5248 weight distribution. Fighter planes need perfect balance for aerobatic maneuvers. Boyer figured a sports car should, too. The suspension was where things got really interesting. Ford engineers used aircraft-grade chromium-vanadium steel for the springs. This wasn't standard automotive practice. This alloy was expensive, about three times the cost of regular spring steel, but it allowed for progressive spring rates that changed based on load, just like aircraft landing gear. The front coil springs were wound with variable pitch, tighter at the top, looser at the bottom. Under normal driving, only the loose coils compressed, 
giving a soft ride, hit a corner hard, and the tight coils engaged, firming everything up. The exhaust system was another piece of aerospace thinking. The dual pipes exited through the bumper, not uncommon, but the internal design used expansion chambers calculated using Bernoulli's principle, the same math that keeps planes in the air. The result? A distinctive burble at idle that transformed into a howl at high RPM, remarkably similar to early jet engines at startup. Now let's talk about those taillights, the ones that started that awkward conversation in Ford's design studio. The F-102 Delta Dagger had just entered service in 1953. Its afterburner created a distinctive circular flame pattern. Ford's designers spent two months figuring out how to replicate that look in chrome and glass. The final design used concentric rings, chrome bezels with stepped glass lenses that created an optical illusion of depth. When you hit the brakes, they didn't just light up. They seemed to ignite. The interior was equally aerospace-inspired. The instrument cluster wasn't just styled to look like aircraft gauges. They were actual aircraft gauges modified for automotive use. Ford contracted with Borg Instruments, who supplied gauges for the F-104 Starfighter. The speedometer went to 150 a permit when most cars topped out at 120. The tachometer, optional and rarely ordered, was mounted on the steering column exactly like a fighter's armament panel. The seats used a foam compound developed for aircraft ejection seats. Standard automotive seats in 1955 used rubberized horsehair or cotton batting. The Thunderbird's foam was a closed cell design that wouldn't absorb water and maintained its shape under extreme G-forces. Overkill for a streetcar? Absolutely. But it meant these seats felt as good after 100,000 miles as they did on day one. Even the paint was aerospace derived. Ford used a new acrylic lacquer developed by DuPont for aircraft use. It was lighter than traditional automotive lacquer, about 12 pounds lighter for a complete paint job. In aviation, every pound matters. Ford's designers applied the same thinking. The Thunderbird's body panels were also thinner than standard 0.035 inches versus 0.040 for regular Fords. That saved another 47 pounds. The convertible top mechanism was engineered by Continental Division, who also built aircraft hydraulic systems. It used a single hydraulic cylinder with dual acting pistons, a design lifted straight from bomber landing gear. The top could go from fully closed to completely hidden in 18 seconds. The contemporary Corvette, manual operation only, and it took about a minute if you knew what you were doing. Production began September 9, 1954. Ford allocated a special section of the Dearborn assembly plant, separated from regular production. Workers were hand-picked from those who'd built B-24 Liberators at Willow Run during the war. These guys understood tight tolerances and precision assembly. The first car off the line, serial number 5H1, went straight to the wind tunnel at the University of Michigan, not for publicity photos, for actual testing. Ford wanted to verify their calculations. At 100 memporish, the Thunderbird generated 47 pounds of front lift and 31 pounds of rear lift. The contemporary Corvette, 97 pounds front, 73 pounds rear. Less lift means more stability at speed. But here's the problem nobody talks about. This aerospace approach was expensive, catastrophically expensive. The variable rate springs alone added $47 to the build cost, roughly $500 in today's money. The aircraft-grade paint, another $35. The hydraulic top mechanism was $270 when the entire car listed for $2,944. Ford was losing money on every single Thunderbird they sold in 1955. The bean counters were not happy. But something unexpected happened. The car became a sensation, not for its performance, but for its image. Marilyn Monroe bought one. So did Frank Sinatra. Clark Gable ordered two, one for him, one for his wife. Suddenly, the Thunderbird wasn't competing with the Corvette for sports car buyers. It had created an entirely new market segment 
the personal luxury car. Sales numbers tell the story. 1955, 16, 155 units versus Corvette's 700. Ford had expected to sell maybe 10,000 Thunderbirds total. They hit that number in the first three months. The Corvette was almost canceled. Chevrolet only kept it alive because Zora Arcus Duntov convinced management that killing it would be admitting defeat. For 1956, Ford doubled down on the aerospace theme. The spare tire moved outside, continental style, to free up trunk space. But the real reason? Weight distribution. Moving 35 pounds from ahead of the rear axle to behind it improved the handling balance. The portholes got bigger. Owners complained about blind spots. Aerospace authenticity be damned. Engine options expanded to include the 312 cubic inch Y block with 215 horsepower, or 225, with the Thunderbird Special High Performance Package. That special package included something remarkable a factory supercharger, not just any supercharger, but a centrifugal unit designed by McCulloch Motors, who built superchargers for military aircraft. It spun up to 20,000 RPM and provided 5 PSI of boost. Power jumped to 300 horsepower. 0 to 60 dropped from 9.5 seconds to 7.2. The quarter mile went from 17.2 at 79 mph to 15.8 at 91 mph. Only 1,158 supercharged birds were built. They had problems, big problems. The belt-driven blower put massive side loads on the crankshaft. Bearings failed. Oil consumption skyrocketed. Ford quietly discontinued the option mid-year and offered to buy back cars from unhappy customers. Today, those supercharged 56 are worth upwards of $200,000. Turns out, collectors love disasters with good stories. The 1957 model should have been the pinnacle. It featured the most powerful engine yet, the 312 with dual quads producing 270 horsepower or 285 with the racing package. The tail fins grew longer, more jet-like. The front bumper was redesigned with intake scoops that actually functioned, directing air to the brakes. Ford even experimented with a turbine engine. Yes, really. They installed a Boeing 50210 gas turbine, basically a helicopter engine, in a modified 57 Bird. It produced 300 horsepower and weighed 200 pounds less than the V8. It also melted the floorboards, consumed fuel at an alarming rate, and sounded like an airport. After three test runs, they quietly parked it. That car still exists, hidden in Ford's Dearborn warehouse. The racing program was where the aerospace engineering really proved itself. NASCAR teams discovered the Thunderbird's superior aerodynamics gave it a 5 math advantage on high-speed ovals compared to conventional sedans with similar power. In 1957, Thunderbirds won 21 NASCAR races. They dominated the Daytona Beach speed trials, hitting 145 mph on the sand, 12 mph, faster than the competition. But Ford was already planning the Thunderbirds' transformation. Market research showed buyers wanted four seats. The purists were horrified. The accountants were thrilled. The 1958 Thunderbird would grow into a proper four-seater, gaining 800 pounds and losing its sports car pretensions. Sales doubled, then tripled. The personal luxury car segment Ford accidentally created would dominate American automotive for the next two decades. The original two-seater run totaled just 53, 166 cars over three years. But those three years changed everything. Before the Thunderbird, American cars were designed by stylists who thought about beauty first, function second. The Bird proved you could apply aerospace engineering to automotive design and create something both beautiful and functional. The influence rippled through the industry. The 1961 Continental? Its designer, Elwood Engel, specifically cited the Thunderbird's aircraft-inspired clean lines. The 1963 Corvette Stingray? Larry Shinoda admitted he studied the bird's aerodynamic principles. Even European manufacturers took notice. Pininfarina bought a 57 Thunderbird and kept it in their Turin studio as a reference for 
American aerodynamic design. Today, aviation-inspired automotive design is so common we don't even notice it. Every car in production uses computational fluid dynamics, a tool developed for aircraft. Active aerodynamics, brake cooling ducts, low drag mirrors, all aerospace technology that filtered down to cars. But in 1955, putting jet fighter design principles into a streetcar was revolutionary. Some called it gimmicky. Ford called it the future. The survivors tell the real story. Of those 53 166 original Thunderbirds, an estimated 40,000 still exist. That's a 75% survival rate, astronomical for a 1950s car. The Corvette from the same era? Maybe 50% survived. Regular 1950s Fords? Less than 10%. Owners knew these cars were special. They preserved them, restored them, passed them down through families. Values reflect that reverence. A perfect 1957 Thunderbird sells for $75,000 to $150,000, depending on options. That supercharged 56? Double those numbers. An F-Code 57 with the racing engine? You're looking at $200,000 minimum. These aren't just collector cars. They're rolling sculptures that represent a moment when American optimism about technology reached its peak. But here's the thing about the Thunderbird's aerospace design. It wasn't just marketing. It wasn't just styling. It was a fundamental rethinking of how cars could be engineered. Every swept line, every calculated angle, every aerospace-grade component had a purpose. Form followed function, but function was defined by the sky, not the street. Ford took a massive financial hit on every two-seat Thunderbird they sold. The aerospace-grade materials, the precision assembly, the wind tunnel testing. It all cost far more than the sticker price could recoup. But they created something more valuable than profit margins. They created desire. They proved American manufacturers could build something sophisticated, something that wasn't just bigger and chromier than last year's model. The two-seat Thunderbird died after 1957, replaced by a bloated boulevard cruiser that sold in huge numbers but lost its soul. Ford tried to recapture the magic with the 2002 retro Thunderbird. It had the porthole. It had the two seats. It even had decent aerodynamics. But it didn't have that desperate urgency to be something new, that willingness to lose money in pursuit of a dream, that crazy idea that a car could be a jet fighter for the street. Looking back, the 55 to 57 Thunderbird represents peak American automotive ambition, not because it was the fastest, it wasn't, not because it was the best handling, it definitely wasn't, but because a room full of executives let their designers and engineers build a car using aircraft principles, damn the cost, damn the practicality, damn everything except the pursuit of something genuinely new. Today's automotive industry would never allow it. The business case wouldn't close. The focus groups would hate it. The accountants would riot. But for three glorious years, Ford built a car that was literally designed like a fighter jet, using fighter jet materials with fighter jet engineering. They lost money on everyone. And they created a legend that still makes people stop and stare almost 70 years later. That's the thing about true innovation. It doesn't make sense at the time. It costs too much. It seems crazy. But sometimes, just sometimes, crazy is exactly what the world needs. The Thunderbird proved that aerospace engineering could create automotive art. It proved that Americans could build something subtle and sophisticated. And it proved that sometimes the best business decision is to ignore the business and build something magnificent. What's your favorite piece of aviation-inspired automotive design? Drop a comment below. And if you want more stories about when car companies went beautifully, expensively insane in pursuit of perfection, hit that subscribe button. Until next time, keep those engines running, whether they're powered by pistons or turbines.